So if you're watching this video, that means you either watch the previous one and want to know how we're going to put a value or quantify the enthalpy change for a thermochemical equation, or you just kind of want an introduction into coffee cup calorimetry. Well, either way, hopefully this video helps you out. So if we take a look at a thermochemical equation, what we need to understand is that there's multiple ways that we can actually quantify or come up with a value for the enthalpy change. One of those ways it requires that we actively and empirically try and establish what these values are using something called calorimetry. So before we get into calorimetry, we need to understand the premise behind it, and that is thermodynamics. The first law of thermodynamics states that energy cannot be created or destroyed. So as a result, the net energy change in the universe for any process or reaction has to be zero. Now what that means for us is that when we're analyzing chemical systems, we have to understand that there's two parts to a reaction or a process. There is the system itself, that is, in simplest terms, the chemical reaction, and then there's everything else effectively in the universe. Now for us, that's generally just the immediate surrounding. So any energy that is lost or gained by that system, by that chemical reaction or process, has to be in turn equally gained or lost by the surroundings. Now how this helps us with calorimetry is that if we have a substance that we understand very well and we can analyze it and figure out how much change or how much energy it took to change that particular substance as a result of a chemical process, a result of a chemical reaction, we can then in turn figure out how much energy must have been lost or gained by that chemical reaction in changing our substance as the surroundings. Now the substance that we know the most about, or at least we know a lot about, and that we're very familiar with, is water. So, if we can figure out what impact a particular process has on the surrounding water, we can then work our way backwards to figure out how much energy was lost or gained. And this is where our coffee cup calorimeter comes in. So in a high school laboratory, it's a really simple piece of equipment that allows us to effectively and efficiently try and figure out what the overall enthalpy change for a reaction in an aqueous solution is. Now, this is fairly limited in that it only allows us to do it in aqueous solutions at relatively low temperatures, but it is fairly efficient because coffee cups are really good insulators. I mean, that's why they're coffee cups. And so as a result, this styrofoam allows us to analyze pretty much the energy change that is going on within it and not have too much energy lost to the coffee cup itself. In addition, we also need to know something about water. Water has a characteristic property that we call specific heat capacity. And that specific heat capacity is how much energy it takes to raise one gram of water by one degree Celsius. And so if we can understand the temperature change of the water within this coffee cup, then we can understand how much energy it must have taken to raise that mass of water by that amount of temperature. And as a result, since Thermodynamics is a zero-sum game. Whatever energy was lost or gained to the water must have been lost or gained from the chemical reaction. So when we perform this reaction within the coffee cup, we have to first understand, we have to first take into account what the mass of the aqueous solution is. Sometimes it's going to be pure water, such as in the case when we're going to dissolve a solid in it. But sometimes there's not going to be pure water in there. Sometimes we have an aqueous solution or two aqueous solutions in there. And we do have to make an assumption here. We make the assumption that this solution is dilute enough that it's going to retain the properties of water. That is, it's going to have the specific gravity or density of water at one gram per milliliter, and it's going to share the same specific heat capacity as water. That is, 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. So ultimately, whatever the aqueous solution is in there, we're going to treat that as the mass of the water that we have in that particular sample. Then, really the only thing that we're doing when we take a look at coffee cup calorimetry, that is the only thing that we're actually measuring, is the temperature change. So when we establish what that temperature change is, and we include this idea of specific heat capacity, and we know the volume of water, and therefore using the density of water, the mass of the water, that allows us to establish this relationship. Where Q, the amount of heat, that the water absorbs or loses to the system is equal to the mass times the specific heat capacity multiplied by the delta T or the change in temperature. Our next step is to change the sign. That is change it from a positive to a negative or a negative to a positive. Now why is that? Well, if 
the surroundings, which in this case is our water, our solution, if the temperature of that water went up, that means that energy was lost by the system and gained by the surroundings. Conversely, if the temperature of the water went down, that means that our surroundings lost energy and our system gained energy. So if we're trying to analyze the overall enthalpy change of the system, we've got to change the sign. Now, as we know, the amount of product produced in a chemical reaction relates to the amount of reactant that we're going to use. The more reactant we use, the more product is going to be produced. Now, similarly, the more reactant we use, the more energy is going to be released or absorbed by a chemical reaction. So, we have to take this into account when we are going through our calculation. Just as we understood that the limiting reagent dictates or determines how much product is going to be produced, the limiting reagent also dictates or determines how much energy is going to be released or how much energy is going to be absorbed. So, at this point, we have to establish, if this is a chemical reaction, which one of these two substances is our limiting reagent. Now, if you're going through a process that doesn't have a limiting reagent, or that itself isn't really a chemical reaction, then obviously you don't have to include this step. But what we do have to figure out for our overall enthalpy change for a chemical reaction is we do have to figure out the number of moles of the substance involved or the number of moles of the limiting reagent that we've just determined. You see, if we're taking a look at enthalpy change, enthalpy change is expressed in kilojoules per mole. So, we have to figure out how much energy is going to be released or absorbed in kilojoules, and you may remember that our Q equals mc delta t, our c was in joules, so we are going to have to take our Q value and convert it into kilojoules before we can express our final answer, and then we are going to include it in this particular relationship, where the overall enthalpy change for this particular reaction is going to be equal to the Q over N, and for a chemical reaction that's going to be the N, or the number of moles of our limiting reagent. Now before you go writing this in as a final thermochemical equation, you also have to consider that we are calculating this in kilojoules per mole. If you were to figure out that your limiting reagent doesn't have a 1 as a coefficient in the balanced chemical equation, you're going to have to change that value, meaning if it had a 2, you would have to double your enthalpy change, because it would be kilojoules per 2 moles in your balanced chemical equation. So keep that in mind when you're putting your value into your final thermochemical equation. So now that we understand what a calorimeter is and what it does, and how we can use it to establish the enthalpy change for a particular reaction, or process, let's quickly review the steps. First, we are going to determine the mass of the reaction mixture. Now for a chemical reaction, such as the case in an acid-base neutralization, we're going to take the two masses of the solutions, again assuming they have the properties of water, and we are going to combine them for our reaction mixture mass. Now, in the situation where we're simply adding a solid to an existing solution or to water, we're just going to use the mass of the solution. Now, step two is going to involve this equation, in which we're establishing the heat that is absorbed by the surroundings. Remember, we're measuring the delta T, the temperature change of the surroundings, that aqueous solution. Step three, we are going to take the Q, the heat that is gained or lost from the chemical reaction, and we are going to change the sign, because whatever heat was lost or gained by the system must have been lost to or gained from the surroundings, in our case, the aqueous environment. Now step four is to determine the limiting reagent if it is a chemical reaction that we're analyzing inside our calorimeter. The limiting reagent, after all, is going to establish how much heat is used or how much heat is absorbed by this process. Then finally, what we're going to do is we are going to take the overall heat that has been gained or lost by the system, we are going to calculate it per mole of the limiting reagent, and we are going to establish our overall enthalpy change per mole of limiting reactant in this equation. Now keep in mind that this is per mole of the limiting reactant, so if there are different coefficients in your chemical equation, you are going to have to take that into account before you put your final value in the thermochemical equation. Now, there are some assumptions that we have to make when performing coffee cup calorimetry calculations. The first, I've already kind of talked about, the solution, we are going to assume, has the same properties of water, that is, the specific heat capacity and the density of water for our initial calculation. We also have to assume that the coffee cup, being styrofoam, is a perfect insulator, which is a pretty reasonable assumption, that is, no energy is lost or gained uh, to or from the coffee cup. Another assumption that we have to make is that the reaction goes to completion, because if it doesn't go to completion, then we're not going to see all of the energy released or not all the energy absorbed. Uh, 
uh, we're going to make the assumption that this occurs under standard conditions, because a lot of these values require us to be under standard conditions, which isn't realistic all the time in a high school laboratory. But if we take these into account, we can usually come up with a fairly reasonable value that is pretty close to the true value for a thermochemical equation in a thermochemical reaction. So calorimetry has helped us empirically, or experimentally, figure out a value or a quantity for a thermochemical equation. But what about those reactions that aren't going to be easily performed in a coffee cup in a high school laboratory? Surely there's got to be another way, or other ways, in order for us to quantify this value and put it into our thermochemical equation. And of course there is. And we'll get there. Thanks for watching.